Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, where we aim to tell it like it is, all biases laid bare. On today's edition, I'll be drawing attention to the importance of great national leaders, in case it wasn't obvious enough. Chuka is also flagging up on an apparently obvious need by saying it's time to reflect on the state of Nigeria and chat the way forward. Some might say, isn't that all we ever do here? And can I say no man is an island and is recommending men take a leaf out of women's book? We the men wait to learn from the women. Aisha Oyebode makes a debut appearance with her advocacy that brings to mind the image of a phoenix. She calls forth Africa to arise out of the ashes. It's the first time for everything. So welcome, Aisha. Liberos wraps up things by maintaining the momentum on critical discussions around the infectious disease bill. It captions it as a motion without movement. We're certainly set to move things forward, so I'll be setting the ball in motion after the break. Everything, even leadership, comes in styles and seasons. Leadership for these times, the importance of great national leaders. So given all that is going around in the world right now, COVID-19, the looming global economic and social crisis, insecurity, terrorism, climate change, and, and in, indeed technological changes that are all happening at the same time, there's no doubt that the world has entered a period of flux when it is not ending anytime soon, a period that indeed calls for steady, measured, and well-reasoned policies and actions to ensure that countries, especially one like Nigeria, plagued by decades of historical misrule, gets its act together to ensure our survival and hopefully our progress. This period, in my mind, calls for incredible, thoughtful, creative, imaginative leadership that is inclusive and inspiring. Nations rise and fall based on the caliber of leaders who rise to power. So look around you today. Do you believe we have such caliber of persons in position of authority today? Clearly, we have a huge leadership deficit. According to Lance Morrow, leaders make things possible. Exceptional leaders, on the other hand, make them inevitable. Our own Chinua Achebe in his book, The Trouble with Nigeria, says the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. There's nothing basically wrong with the Nigerian land or climate or water or air or anything else. The Nigerian problem is the unwillingness or inability of his leaders to rise to the responsibility, to the challenge of personal example, which are the hallmarks of true leadership. Indeed, for me, just like any building which is intended to stand the test of time, I guess this is where Chuka will tell us some more, creativity, careful planning, and diligent execution is vital in ensuring the delivery of a final project, which will be valued and admired for decades to come. The same is required in my mind to build a nation, especially one like ours, which was created out of many pre-colonial nation states. So indeed, leadership matters. The role of someone like Deng Xiaoping of China is one concrete example. His decision in the early 60s um, to change agricultural policies and commercial policies of, of that country changed. President Park of Republic of Korea, his decision to industrialize a country is another example of leaders playing an important catalyzing role in economic growth of their people. History is replete with stories and folklore around the role played by leaders in establishing nation states and moving their countries to great strides. Chucky's Kamal Atatok. The Kennedy in America, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, Winston Churchill, Queen Amina, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Thomas Sankara, and the list goes on and on. I mean, recently we can talk about Nelson Mandela's role in South Africa. People have often blamed citizens, on the other hand, saying that the failure of leaders is a result of the failure of citizens. Well, because it's the people that elect leaders. 
Well, for me, this is a fallacy. Who elected a coupist? Nature does not work that way in my mind. Just look at worker ants and bees, bee colonies, for example, of the role of leadership. Again, no one running for office ever said, vote for me so I can give you poor health care and take away your jobs, and I'll perhaps be so incompetent that millions of you will become poorer and live under rising insecurity. What we currently have is a set of leadership committed with a blood oath to the status quo of compromise and incompetence, more committed to protecting their image and status than actual focus and service. In Nigeria, we've been incredibly unlucky with leadership at all levels, whether civilian or military, perhaps due to how the country was formed. According to Professor George Obiozo, not one of the leaders we have had have been able to evolve a unifying national ideology that was embraced either by the fellow, fellow political elites or by the entire Nigerian populace. Yet these leaders keep talking about how Nigerian unity is not negotiable. It's quite ironic indeed. When Nigerian leaders past and present have been unable to deliver any kind of leadership that inspires unity. So for me, Nigeria's unity is definitely negotiable and must be renegotiated for it to stand or survive the test of time. Unity is not something that is coerced. It arises of a conscious willingness of a group or people to come together for their common interest. It is clear, at least now, that our diversity is in disarray. Insecurity grows. Our economy is in near shambles. We have become the poverty capital of the world with over 100 million people in horrible poverty. And our current democracy deficit lies dangerously close to bankruptcy. But let me end here and, and allow my, my colleagues to jump in. Let me end by quoting Professor Obiozo again. If we're to salvage our country, we must begin to face reality, stop the syndrome of self-deception and self-delusion about Nigeria's historical exceptionality. And I completely agree with him here. Thank you. I mean, you, you said a lot of things which I agree with. Um, I hope you're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> surprised today you agree with me. No, because you made sense yeah. to me anyway. Um, there, there, there is Maybe quite because a... Because you're not discussing Christianity. No, I'm sure he mentioned he'll go there eventually. But, um, he may, you know, the thing about leadership, it, it's, mm. significant, it's more significant than we appreciate. Yeah. Yes, and it's good you took on that because I've been one of those who say when you're trying to get people to rise up to their responsibility um, of holding the leaders accountable, you sort of say you get the leaders you deserve. And I know there's a context for that, but actually, to be honest, if you have good leaders, even those people will we'll be inspired rise enough yeah. to rise. So if when you start doing which came first, chicken or the egg, I'm inclined to think good leadership comes before, <laughs> before the, the followership. However, where I then come in is to say, and thank you for the people you listed, it's helpful to remember mm -hmm. that. Um, where I, I then say, okay, when you now have that leadership, even if they are good, if you don't have people who are informed enough to engage them and to keep them accountable and honest, even good leaders will turn bad. So we, this is where it becomes a partnership. Yep. At some point, we need to also recognize that building a nation and a strong democracy has to involve people engaging and interrogating the leaders that we have. And to that extent, I think we're beginning to do that more now with whatever leaders we have. And I can see that it is bearing fruit when we've done it. It's just that we don't have the, the right kind of leadership to begin with. And that's where I stop. I, I think Chuka is um, itching to... Chuka! <laughs> so I, I, was just, I was just listening to you. Um, yeah, chicken and egg, very good uh, analogy there by you. And yes, um, I think that we, some blame has to go to the people of Nigeria um, because these people, leaders and what, what, what we call leaders and so on, but we don't even have leaders anyway, really. We're just misusing the word. We have rulers. Um, um, so maybe first, if we don't misuse it, we might get ourselves in the right frame of mind to, to talk. Um, but they come from us. And I think there's some deep-seated problem that we really need to get down to with us, the country as a whole. Interesting point. It's becoming obvious now. Because we're just recycling the same thing. And they use, we, we feel like we're in a hopeless situation. And I know that that's because where we are drawing from, we already know what is there. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know that um, you get what I, I mean. Is that Aisha, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm sorry, I'm here sorry. rather. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so I think um, there's the followership issue, but from my perspective, I think part of good leadership is being able to acknowledge when you really do not have the capacity to lead. And that applies to all of us. You know, so 
I mean, you look at the fact that what has been a challenge, you've had what we call, you know, leaders that when we were, or if we were still an industrial age country, you know, then they would be the right kind of leaders. But, you know, Nigeria has moved beyond that. Look at even our demographics. Look at the youth. Even our generation is beginning to get old in relation to them. And I think it's being able to say, you know what, I need to stand down because, you know, I really do not work, have what it takes. Yeah. You know, I think that's a very, very important acknowledgement of, you know, what it takes. I don't have the capacity. There's nothing wrong with saying that. And I think that's yeah. an important thing that we need to think about. But then, so that then brings me to the next question, which is the really hard one. How do we then fight to make sure that the leadership is now transferred to the generation that actually should be leading? I think that's a really, really difficult and challenging. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, we were basically looking at leadership from just one prison, political leadership. Um, if that's the leadership we're discussing here, then we really don't have political leaders, but rulers. Okay. Um, or we have, and then it's quite unfortunate when we say, oh, because they are drawn from amongst us. Uh, are they time. really drawn from amongst us? That's a big Once question. Once upon a time. That's a big question. And then if you look at, um, for you to understand our political leadership, you also need to first and foremost understand our cultural and traditional leadership. In African or Nigerian traditional leadership, the leader can do no wrong. They can't, they can do no wrong. And so, also, we also forget as at that time, for you to be a traditional leader, you must also evolve through a system where you will be taught and trained to do no wrong. And, um, and that's why, if you, rem if you remember the old Oyo Empire, there were checks where a traditional ruler can be asked to go and commit suicide for doing wrongs. But, we imbibe that traditional role into our political leadership and still maintain that idea of the leader can do no wrong. And that's why you hear Ajimobi say, you are talking, do you know who you are talking to? I'm the constituted authority. But you forget that, we're forgotten that for you to assume that position, there is supposed to be a higher responsibility. There's supposed to be a training. There's supposed to be um, a, a leadership training program that you ought to go through to emerge as a leader, and not because one person just raised your hand and said, go and be. And so if you take, I, I, I did an advocacy on this long time ago. So if you take a look at all of the presidents that we have had, none of them, even this one that came, people went to beg him, come and be, mm -hmm. and, and for, to protect certain interests. And so, and then you look at the people that, you know, these people are confronted with at the polls. You look at all of them and you say, choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. And then you turn around to say they are drawn from amongst us. I, I have that, more to say, but because yeah. time is up. I, I Let think, me wait for the next, I, I next think time round. time is up, but, but uh, very impressive. I, I mean, I mean, it's the whole idea was just to, you know, push the button on this thing. Well, interestingly, what Emeka has been uh, discussing with us is uh, very similar to what I'm about to discuss as well. So after the break, we're going to carry on.